Hey gang, welcome to Time in the Market, the investing channel with a long-term focus. Today I'm going to take a look at Genius Sports, ticker G-E-N-I. Somebody mentioned that I should take a look at their Q3 earnings since I haven't made a video about this company since August. And this is a company that I do own. Uh, if you look at their long-term chart, it is not good. And the reason for that is this was part of the SPAC bubble. It has crashed since then. A lot of these companies went public at really high valuations and went up from there because of the SPAC bubble in 2021. They have long since crashed. And when I was buying the stock, it was trading in that two to three to four dollar range. And when I bought it, I probably have made this my fourth or fifth largest holding, depending on the day. So even though the chart long term looks really bad, year to date, the stock is up 75%, which is not a bad return for people who are buying at the beginning of the year or buying sub $6, which is where it's trading today. Uh, so Genius Sports is a sports data and technology company. They are kind of a intermediary between sports leagues and bookmakers. They get data rights from the sports leagues. They provide official sports data to the bookmakers like FanDuel, DraftKings, those sort of companies. They also work with sports leagues, bookmakers, and media companies on an advertising business that they have to kind of guide new users to those companies uh, and to those leagues. And on top of that, they also have a sports technology business where they have computer vision technology companies uh, that help with visualization and graphics for live streams and broadcasts for companies like CBS and Amazon Prime Video. So looking at the earnings, really, really solid 29% growth versus last quarter. EBITDA growth is 131% versus last quarter because margins are growing really well, 10% in Q322, 17% in Q323 on the EBITDA margin side. And the nice thing about Q3, as they guided for in Q2, they were actually free cash flow positive, which is a great thing. Uh, their balance sheet is really solid, $160 million of cash with no actual debt. And they are continuing to expand their technology footprint by launching all of these new products. I won't really go into detail about them too much, but really the business is not just a betting business. It's a business that works on the technology side, works on the advertising side, and is starting to really click on a bunch of cylinders and the stock price is starting to reflect that. Again, you can kind of look at the long-term view and say, well, this is a dud, but it was just overpriced. And now it's finally getting to a fairly priced position. Uh, and the year over year growth is reflected in the year over year return because 75% returns year to date are pretty darn good. Uh, so as you look at their guidance for 23, it's actually up again. I think they've raised their guidance about four times because every quarter has been really solid. So 412 million up from 391 at the beginning of the year on the revenue side, 53 million EBITDA guidance up from 41 million to begin the year. And again, free cash flow positivity in Q3, positive free cash flow in the second half of 2023 is the expectation. And then my expectation would be positive free cash flow in 2024 and on a go forward basis, which is a good thing. If you look at their EPS, it's still negative because of the depreciation and amortization of their data rights and their business. So they have to amortize their data rights, uh, which a lot of companies don't have to do. And they also do dilute a little bit with stock-based compensation, which is a non-cash expense, which does not show up in the free cash flow. So we'll have to think about the dilution when we look at the valuation. So really solid returns. I'll link this down below so you can kind of look at the technology that they're releasing out there. Betvision is an interesting one. They work with bookmakers like Caesars to essentially embed a video stream within the app, the betting app. And within that embedded stream, you can place bets live. You can look at statistics live. You can look at data visualizations live. And this is probably still a small part of their business because this only airs games if and only if they are airing for free in your local area. So think your, your local CBS game, your local Fox game, whatever. But the story as they tell it is that 54% of the bets made by those streamers that were in those apps were in-play bets. And the nice thing about in-play bets is in-play bet margin for a company like Genius Sports is almost triple what it is from pre-game bet because of the need for live data for those bets. Uh, and as more and more of the handle moves towards in-play betting, Genius Sports makes more money. And that's a good thing for shareholders. 
if you think about an immature market like the United States, only 20% of the bets are in play bets versus a more mature market where it's more in the 50% range, which is closer to what we're seeing here within this bet vision app. So again, Q3 results exceeding guidance. We'll look at the financials again when I look at the pricing that I would deem as fair value, but overall earnings were really solid. But there's a couple of negative things I wanna talk about because often when I look at this company in some of my prior videos, it's all positive, positive, positive. So I do wanna take a look at some of the negative things that do exist with this company. One is as we look at data rights, data rights are getting more and more expensive. And this is perfectly illustrated by the August renewal of their NFL deal. So when they signed this deal with the NFL in 2021, they gave the NFL 18 and a half million warrants that they could execute at one cent. They haven't yet with the option to receive 2 million additional warrants for each of the two more additional extensions that they were going to have. So in essence, the NFL already has 18 and a half million warrants. They had the option to get four more million warrants with this extension. Instead of doing that though, they said, you know, we don't really want those warrants probably because the stock is down 75% since they signed that initial deal. We want to be paid in cash in lieu of those warrants. And the CEO spun this as not dilutive to shareholders, so it's better. We give them a predetermined cash amount, it's better. But nobody really said what that cash amount was. Well, if you look at through their data license agreement costs in their quarterly filings, looking at Q3 2022 filing, you can kind of see that in 23 and 24, they were expecting to spend about 110 million ish per year on data rights. Now, as you look at the latest filings, those data right costs are up quite a bit. You're talking about 150 to 170 million, depending on the year. And again, this includes not only that e NFL deal, but also the football data co slash EPL deal, probably some other deals they signed. But at the end of the day, data rights costs are going up. And that is not a good thing for margins because they're paying more money for data rights. Now, one could say that they can go back to the sports books they could work with and maybe instead of one and a half percent for pre game betting they get one and a half one point six percent or something like that and basically renegotiate those deals uh and hopefully that's what they do but at the end of the day this is a net negative because they're paying more for data rights and they have to make that up somewhere now the nice thing about management's perspective on this so far is again they still hit free cash flow positivity and Q3 2023, expect to do so in 2023 for the second half of the year. Hopefully they guide for positive free cash flow because that's what I expect in 2024. And they're also still guiding for long-term EBITDA margins of 30%, which I think is optimistic based on what sports rate are seeing and they're a more mature business, but they're not really backing off of that despite the fact that sports rights are going higher. However, this does show that this is a competitive landscape not just sports radar that's out there looking for these deals it's also companies like img arena which is owned by endeavor and other players in the space as well uh, speaking of competition we can look at the technology side as being very competitive as well so second spectrum basically had the data capture and data analytics deal with the nba they didn't have the data rights deal to sell to bookmakers they had the data capture deal unfortunately based on this article in The Guardian, which is a really good article, actually. Uh, Hawkeye, which is a different company, actually took the data capture rights away from Second Spectrum, which shows the competitive nature of this landscape. Initially, it seems like they also took the data analytics side of things. But when the NBA teams actually looked at what Hawkeye could provide, they saw that it wasn't as good or detailed as Second Spectrum. So the NBA brought back Second Spectrum as the data analytics provider despite them not actually having the data capture uh, side of things, which is interesting that two different companies can be in this space, but it does show that this space is very competitive and it's not just sports radar and genius sports that are out there doing this stuff. It's also other companies that you probably haven't even heard about because I hadn't even heard about Hawkeye tracking until this article came out and I will link this down below, but it's an interesting read. Um, as we talked about dilution when it came to stock-based compensation or the fact that the NFL still owns 18 and a half million warrants that they haven't exercised and they can exercise at any time during the next years at one cent. There's also a secondary offering that happened in September and the 
way to think about this is Apex Partners, which was the selling shareholder at time of SPAC, still retains 60 million shares as of 12-31-22. If you look at their ownership filing, they are shown as Maven top holdings, but this is just a holding company for Apex Partners. So as of 12-31-22, they own 60 million shares. Well, in September of 2023, they sold 20 million ordinary shares at a price of 535, which is about 10% lower than the price today and about 10% lower than the price it was trading at, at the time uh, because they want to, to get some money out of this deal, right? So they still own about 40 million shares after the secondary offering, which to me as a shareholder means that, you know, these guys sold shares already in 2021 at time of SPAC. They did another secondary offering when it was trading at $19 in 2021. At the time, actually Genius Sports did a primary offering. They raised money, good opportune time to raise money. And now they're also doing a secondary offering again in 2023. To me, it seems like they're sort of slowly exiting the Genius Sports business. Don't know how many shares they wanna hold on forever or for an extended period of time. But there's always the risk that there's another secondary offering ahead for shareholders. And that is going to put pressure on investors when that happens. So I'm a bit wary about something like that, and I'm a bit concerned that it will put, the, put pressure on the stock price when and if it does happen. Another piece of negative news that came out in October is Panda Interactive filed suit not only against Genius Sports, but also Sports Radar for infringing on some of the technology that they say they have patents on, whether it's for sports betting or interactive streaming. But this is something that's going to play out in court over the next couple of months slash years, and it's certainly a negative when it comes to being an investor in Genius Sports because you don't really know what kind of impact this will have on the business and it's very hard to tell what sort of impact this will have on the business now. So those are kind of the negative side of things and when I talked about the dilution that kind of exists with the warrants that the NFL owns, there's also the invested securities that they have out there due to their sport stock-based compensation and the restricted shares and options that the management has. There's a potential for 13 to 14% dilution out there. That's another negative thing. I think the NFL will eventually <laughs> use their vested warrants. They have the option to exercise those at one cent so they can immediately make you know, a ton of money when that happens uh, because they can exercise them at one cent and immediately sell them at $6, right? That's going to put pressure not only on the dilution but also on the price of the shares because they're, there's an additional 20 million shares that are potentially being sold right away. So is there going to be another secondary offering from the NFL? There was just one from the primary shareholder, Apex Partners. The NFL could also have one in the future when and if they exercise those warrants. So another negative thing to think about. Um, so that's negative. <laughs> and not to be too negative, but a positive thing that just came out a couple of days ago is that Genius Sports renewed their FIBA strategic partnership for a variety of things that they offer to FIBA. The nice thing about this is that it runs through 2035. The concerning thing about this, not really concerning, but the questionable thing about this is whenever these news snippets come out, it's like, yes, we signed this deal. It's great. It's through X. But as an investor, you have no idea what this means for the financials, right? Is it a good deal? Is it a bad deal? It seems like they're renewing something that already existed in place starting in 2025. Is it a better deal than they had prior to 2025? How much better is it? What other new technologies are they selling FIBA that they haven't had in place before? I wish there was more clarity on that as an investor in relation to exactly what they're offering, what it means for the financials, et cetera. Um, I, I think they'll probably talk about that during their next earnings call. But until then, you're kind of just like, well, this is good, but exactly how good is it? And that's the question mark I always have when it comes to these news releases, because even with the news release around the NFL deal, it's like, yeah, it's great. And on the earnings call, they said, yeah, it's not dilutive, but it seems like it costs a lot of money. So it's, it's sort of an uncertainty whenever those new deals come out. And as an investor, I don't love uncertainties. Uh, and there's a lot of uncertainties here. That's kind of the, the negative side of things. As this is a business that's growing really well. You can kind of see their estimates. 75% growth in 21, 30% growth in 22, expected 21% growth in 23, decent growth going forward. Business is really clicking on all cylinders. Margins are improving, going to get to free cash flow positivity probably for the full year in 24. We'll get more details on that in the next quarter's earnings. But 
there's a lot of these question marks. You know, there's a lawsuit out there. Uh, the NFL has a bunch of warrants they're going to exercise. Apex Partners keeps doing secondary offerings. Sports rights are expensive. Now, you can kind of the, discount all that and say, yeah, but it's growing. But it's something you do have to keep in mind as you talk about their financials and as you talk about the valuation that you have out there. Because that is an important part of the business. So as I look at the valuation side of things, and as always, guys, disclaimer, um, please do your own due diligence before making any investment decision. This video is purely for informational, educational, and entertain entertainment purposes only. It is not investment advice. So as, as I look at the valuation here, you can kind of look at this company. It's not really free cash flow positive in 2022. It's not going to be free cash flow positive in 2023. So free cash flow yield is still negative. But balance sheet's really solid. Debt's really solid. Market cap is at $1.2 billion against you know, 340 million in revenue. I think in the long run, this is a business that's going to start churning out free cash flow, uh, probably starting in 2024. I hope it's starting in 2024, but it's not quite there yet. They don't pay a dividend. Uh, they have been issuing stock based compensation at a decent clip, but that's starting to slow down. However, it's still relatively dilutive. So as we look at some of the dilution that they have out there and the potential for further dilution from the NFL, we have to account for that within our pricing. So as I kind of look at 2023, negative free cash flow margin going into 2024 and onwards, I'm expecting slowing growth, but still double digit revenue growth until 2027 and margins that are getting up there to a mature margin that's closer to 12% free cash flow margins. And if you think about 12% free cash flow margins, often these types of businesses have 60% free cash flow conversion. I'm probably thinking 18% EBITDA margins, maybe 20% EBITDA margins to get to 12% free cash flow margins. Now, Genius Sports Management is getting closer to 30% free uh, EBITDA margins. Now, if they can reach that, that's amazing, but I just don't see that as being realistic in the short term yet. So I'm kind of assuming a bit lower margins and I'm assuming margins that are more in line with sports radar, which is a bit of a more mature company. And if those guys are hitting, you know, 20 to 22% EBITDA margins, I think Genius Sports can do that within the next couple of years. And if they do that, assuming about 60% free cash flow conversions, they would hit about 12% free cash flow margins. On the buyback side, you look at this and say it's very negative. And the reason I'm doing very negative buybacks, so basically negative 200 million in buybacks, which is quite dilutive. If you think about 200 million in buybacks against 1.2 million in market cap, it's about 16% dilution. This could be seen as conservative, but the reason I'm doing that is one, the NFL will eventually exercise these warrants. And these warrants are going to be immediately dilutive to the company. And because of the stock-based compensation this company has done in the past two to three years, there's going to be a lot more dilution from settled RSUs and PSUs. And that amounts to about 13% dilution all in. And on top of that, they're still issuing stock-based compensation without buying back any shares, which is automatically dilutive as well. So that's why you're seeing very negative dilution here. And you can kind of say that's too conservative and you can certainly remove this. I will share this sheet with you. You can just hit file, make a copy and play around with it. But for me, it makes sense. That's just the reality of the situation. They're issuing stock-based compensation in the neighborhood of 5 million a quarter. At the moment, there's potential dilution due to the unvested and vested shares that are out there and warrants that are out there. And that's just the reality. The reality is that 208 million shares that are out there right now are probably gonna be higher in the next five years. That's just the reality and I'm counting for that here. Um, when I look at what valuation should a company like this have if it's continuing to grow at about you know low teens by 2027, I'm sort of in that four to 5% free cash flow yield range, closer to 4%. That's where I'm placing it. 75% of my weighing goes on the 4% free cash flow yield scenario in 2027. 25% of it goes on the 5% free cash flow yield. And as you look at these assumptions here, this stock buyback, and again, this buyback is very dilutive on the buyback yield based on today's price point of 595, I'm getting about an expected return of 6.8%. And you can play around with this quite a bit. Right. If you remove buybacks altogether, if you don't think there's going to be any dilution, you get back to 9%. So you can kind of see the impact that dilution has 
on shares like this. If within the next couple of years, they institute a share buyback plan, for example, the dilution could be a lot less worse than I'm showing here. If they grow at a faster clip, for example, the uh, return could be a lot higher than I'm showing here. Those are the kind of the assumptions you're making. For me, if I'm targeting a return of about 10%, I need a fair value of about $5.16 based on these assumptions. So if I'm targeting 10%, it's about $5.16. This is a riskier stock than I typically invest in because of the lawsuit out there, because of the risk of dilution, the unknown around the, law, uh, the data rights cost, some of these other things we talked about. If I wanna aim for 15%, I have a fair value of about $4.13. Um, and to me, this doesn't mean that I don't think this stock is a good value at today's price because I'm still holding it. And that the reason I hold it is because, hey, if this is a company that can actually hit 30%, uh, EBITDA margins in the long run, that would mean that free cash flow margins are going to be in that high teens range. You're talking about a 16% return from today's prices and a fair value closer to $7.88. I just don't know that to be the case right now. Now, management is telling me that that's their aim long term. And if that actually ends up being the case, this could still be a really good valuation at today's price point. But right now, I just don't see that in the returns. I have to get more guidance. I have to get more... Um, more of a view into their future margins. And the only comparison I have out there is a company like Sports Radar, which is publicly traded, and they're certainly not hitting 30% EBITDA margin. And I think they're a solid company as well. I also own shares of Sports Radar. So for me, it kind of makes sense to be conservative here, kind of makes sense to be realistic around growth, around margins, around buybacks and the dilution that exists out there. And from that perspective, you know, you're not getting a massive return from today's price point but if you're a bit more optimistic about their long-term margins you are so that's really the the thesis you would have if you're buying at today's price point that the margins are probably going to be closer to 18 to 20 percent which gets you into that high teens return from a long-term perspective that's an annual return that's not a total return that's an annual return so that's my take on it um, still a shareholder of Genius Sports, still like the company. I'm not super thrilled about the uncertainty around the lawsuit, around the dilution, around the secondary shareholder sales, uh, but that's the reason I'm not buying more today. You know, if this stock were to fall back into that $4, per, $4 range, would I buy more? Yeah, because that's really where I was buying initially, right? If you're talking about 3 to $4, you're talking about 15 to 20% returns from based on these assumptions. And that's pretty good. And I think these assumptions are relatively conservative. Um, but let me know what you think. If you're a shareholder of Genius Sports, do you agree with my assessment here? Or do you disagree? Do you think I missed anything? Uh, if you're not a shareholder, uh, let me know what you think about the video. As always, like, subscribe, uh, and let me know in the comments down below if you want me to look at any other companies as well. I would be happy to do that. So thanks for watching and bye.